Let's try this synthesis. Well, it'll be a good first step. Can't you do it this time? You can do both. You can start either with SO3, with you mean HSO4, or with NO2, HNO3, and HSO4. Yeah, let's see. Do you think either of those would work? Start with SO3 first because that's a meta director, but if you start with NH2 first, that's an ortho -director. director. Oh, oh, I thought you were telling us to get to the NH2. Yeah, it seems like it might work either way. But it's lost steps if you just add this. The one thing I would be worried about is. Um, if we add a nitro group, is that going to make it easier or hard to add the sulfonic acid group? Hard. Hard. And in fact, the nitro group, remember, is just about the most deactivating of all the deactivators. So that might be one reason maybe we should add uh, this group first over here so that we don't need to worry so much, uh, so it's not substituent. so hard to add the second substituent. I mean, when we add the second substituent, couldn't we just add the NH2 alone? I know you can't do that. Yeah. So what would be a good step for adding the sulfonic acid? What reagents do we need? And I so three minus SO3 normal. Yeah, neutral SO3. Or you could say fuming sulfuric acid, but that means sulfuric acid to which extra gaseous sulfur trioxide has been added. So we have to indicate the sulfur trioxide. We just memorized that that's a good way to put on a sulfonic acid group. And then our next reagents would be Now, this is a deactivator and a meta director. So it looks like we'll get the substituent in the right place. But it's not as deactivating as a nitro group, so it won't be as hard as if we added the nitro group first. And then for the last step. Any reduction. Right. Uh, but it seems like it, uh, in this case, it does seem like you could do it in either direction. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly fine. You could do that in either direction. Ah, I see. Now let's come up with a way to do this synthesis from benzene. for that are that's a good first step we can use any of these reagents for reduction Now that was a good synthetic plan. It wouldn't have done any good to put the sulfonic acid on this version because nitro is a meta director and we want to put this in the para position. So first we have to change the directing ability of the nitro so that we had a para director so that the substituent would end up in the right place. But actually this is an ortho para director. So how can we be confident that we don't need to worry about the ortho attacks here? That's right. Now, we talked about in the past how usually you get both ortho and para, but usually more para. However, the more steric hindrance there is, the less ortho you're going to get and the more para. And we should just memorize that these sulfon groups are so big that they get very little ortho, usually, and almost all para. I, I said previously that normally you should think about both the or ortho and the para products, despite the steric hindrance issue. But there's so much steric hindrance for the SO3H that we can usually go ahead and ignore the ortho attacks. So we're not going to worry about the ortho attacks here. We're going to get a good yield 
um, adding the SO3H here because it's so big. So that's something that oftentimes people don't realize from lecture. We can assume this is very big and gives, um, usually gives very little of the ortho attack, mainly the para attack. And then our last step would be now we need the per acid to do the oxidation. Now this is the first example that we've done, I think, where we had to go in both directions in a single problem. First we went to the right, and then we went to the left. We, um, why couldn't we just start with the NH2? Because we don't know a way to put NH2 on. The only way we know to put nitrogens on is the nitro group. So even though we wanted the NH2, we had to start with the nitro. Then we went to here to get the NH2 to get the directing ability, and then we went back to the nitro because that's what the problem was asking us for. So uh, notice how much harder this was than the previous problem, even though the previous problem we did was this. Here there were lots of different ways that we could synthesize this. This was easy, but just changing the position of the substituents made it quite a bit harder. I think one mistake that people tend to make is they tend to think maybe that this reagent is for the forward reaction, or these reagents are for the reverse. You want to make flashcards so you know exactly what reagents are for what reactions. So the trick we use there is called um, changing the directing sense. similar. We have to learn how to change this carbon from a carbonyl to a normal CH2. Isn't it just Wolf-Kishner? We definitely could use the Wolf-Kishner reaction to go in the forward direction. Pardon? That's right. Well, we could use the Wolf-Kishner uh, to go in the forward direction. However, uh, in this chapter they focus more, here's where they use what's called the Clemenson reduction. So the reagents that they mentioned in the book are the second set of reagents is the Clemenson reduction. The zinc mercury amalgam acid and heat is the Clemenson reduction. An alternative is just to do a hydrogenation in ethanol solvent. So actually now at this point we've learned a bunch of different ways to turn carbonyls into CH2 groups. Here's the Clemenson reduction. We've also learned the Wolf-Kishner reduction. And this might not come up in your class very much. Do you, do you remember we also saw how to make theoacetals and use rainy nickel? Um, and that, the, all of those have the same effect of turning a carbonyl into a CH2 group. So how do you know which one to use? Well, for some reason, usually when we're dealing with benzene rings, we usually use the Clemenson reduction. Uh, but more generally, the Clemenson reduction is done under acidic conditions, as you can see. How about the Wolf-Kishner reduction? Because it involves the hydroxide. And if you go back and look at the theoacetal and desulfurization, that's under neutral conditions. So if for some reason you wanted to avoid a base, you'd want to avoid the Wolf-Kishner. Or if you wanted to avoid an acid, you'd want to avoid the Clemenson. If you want something in neutral conditions, you could use that sulfur reaction, although that doesn't come up that much. So that gives you three different options in case there's something else in the molecule that's sensitive to acid or base for some reason. But for some reason, usually with benzene, people usually use the Clemenson reduction. So that's probably what you want to use on the test. The Clemenson one is only the ZNHG. That's right. So just the second set of reagents, the zinc mercury amalgam, acid, and heat, that's called the Clemenson reduction. This first reaction is just a kind of a hydrogenation, like we've seen uh, in, in other cases. This hydrogenation here would only work well on a benzylic carbon, like we have here. By the way, what's the name of this carbon? This is the benzylic carbon. That's a good name to know. This carbon here. So we're turning the benzylic carbon from a carbonyl into a CH2 group. Normally, carbonyls are not very easy to hydrogenate, but the benzylic carbonyl is easier to hydrogenate. And we also need to know how to go in the reverse direction. 
So we need the reagents for that reverse reaction as well. Is that reverse reaction going to be an oxidation or a reduction? Oxidation. That's right. And you might remember our old friends, the chromium reagents that we often use for oxidations. So the book lists. Chromium trioxide, acid, and water. These would all be used together. So the book lists one way to do the reverse reaction here. One thing that you might have already started learning in chapter 22 is that the benzylic carbon is more reactive than normal carbons. For example, you can't just take any old CH2 group and oxidize it like this. Normally, we would only start, this would only work on an alcohol. If you remember, normally we use chromium reagents on alcohols, not just normal CH2s, but it turns out that this benzylic carbon is uh, unusually reactive. So even though it doesn't have an alcohol, it can still be oxidized.